Welcome back to World War II TV. Well, who do you think you are kidding, Mr. Hitler? We all know the Dad's Army theme song, but does the iconic TV comedy show the reality of Britain's uh, defence in 1940 and the early part of the war? Well, to take us through this, uh, first time guest on World War II TV, Chris Kolonko. So I'm going to bring him in now. So good evening, sir. How are you today? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. My voice is just about holding out, but I can't guarantee that last 20 minutes, but who knows? <laughs> so, well, thank you. But some people probably won't know about Dad's Army. If you're perhaps watching this in Singapore or, or Canada or other places, but for anyone British, it is just so ingrained in our culture. You know, whenever a TV show or an event gets cancelled, on goes a Dad's Army repeat. And it's left us with this whole idea of what the defence was like. But we're going to unravel yeah. that uh, with you. I'm going to load out a PowerPoint. So basically, over to you, Chris. Take us through cool. this idea of Dad's Army. Is it a documentary or or, or is it reality? <laughs> Over to you. Okay, no, yeah, cheers, Paul. Thank you. Right, so um, whenever I'm doing a presentation, so I'm an archaeologist. I specialise in the UK Second World War home front, uh, in particular anti-invasion defences. Um, and whenever I'm doing a talk on the anti-invasion defences, I always have one of my first slides being this one, which is just highlighting that Dad's Army isn't actually a documentary. Um, so... The title is generally just to clarify that Dad's Army is indeed not a documentary. Uh, and from my perspective, um, as a specialist in the period, um, it's quite weird seeing it treated almost as it is a documentary and seems to form the basis for the national narrative of the defence of the UK uh, following the fall of France in 1940. So, although undoubtedly one of the best sitcoms, um, one of the best British sitcoms ever written, um, today Dad's Army has essentially a huge influence over how the invasion threat and the associated defences are perceived and remembered. So it's not just members of the public that do this, but also historians and even TV producers, you know, appear to use Dad's Army as almost a primary source of historical information, when as such, it, it's a TV programme for the 1960s and 70s. It's not a reliable source of information, but we'll go through that during this talk. So although Dad's Army does give some insight into the formative months of the local defence volunteers who later became the Home Guard, um, and some of the issues that the uh, organisation faced, it's literally by no means representative of the Home Guard as an organisation itself and goes quite some way to actually skew understanding of the actual effectiveness or how effective the Home Guard would have been if they were ever deployed. But when we see them in context, uh, we start to get a better idea of their potential for effectiveness and where they sat within the Home Forces um, within the UK. Um, another key, key issue with Dad's Army is that it doesn't actually provide even, um, an accurate timeline for the development of the Home Guard as well. So the Home Guard's development itself was actually quite prolonged. So when they were formed in May 1940, it wasn't until 1942, 1943, in some case, or in most cases, where they were actually becoming the primary force of defence of the country. So this is a, a lot later than most people actually realise. And it's actually, especially in 1943, after the invasion or threat of immediate invasion was considered over as well. And again, this this kind of squashed timeline as presented by Dad's Army doesn't show the, show the reality of the Home Guard's history during the Second World War. Um, so... Um, Although, yeah, Home Guard, um, Dad's Army gives some insight into the Home Guard, it's by no means um, a reliable or accurate portrayal of not only the Home Guard, but also the period in, within which it's, it's set. Um, and another key issue is that the context within the Home, uh, within the home Force, where the Home Guard would have originally sat, is rarely hinted at as well. Obviously, the, home, uh, the focus of the entire programme is upon the Home Guard. So they're not going to go into like the organisation of local defence or national defence within the Home Forces. It's not within the scope of the programme. Um, but yeah, today, setting the Home Guard in context is vitally important. That's something I'm going to do, hopefully, within this 20-minute uh, talk. And I'll give you some case studies that from my own research into the defence of East Yorkshire. So um, as such, uh, Dad's Army today continues to lead many people to uh, believe that the defence of the UK, you know, in its portrayal of bumbling old fools and uh, young kids and all that, seems to give make many people believe that the defence of the UK following the fall of France in 1940 was essentially half arsed and not taken seriously at the time and was undertaken exclusively by poorly armed, bumbling old men and stupid boys when in reality... The opposite is true, and hopefully I'll give, kind of scratch the surface on this um, as we go through this talk. So, Dad's Army today is actually a massive influence on essentially every aspect of uh, the defence of the UK. And I'm sure that when I've popped this image up, this is one of my favourite images of the um, 
the defense of the UK in 1940. I'm sure some of our viewers would have thought that's a member of the Home Guard. The reality is it's not. That's a soldier from the 4th Battalion Royal Norfolk Regiment near Great Yarmouth in around July, August 1940. So the prime kind of invasion threat period in 1940. So the uh, Royal Norfolk Regiment, I'm going to try not to go off on a tangent here, but they were deployed within the 18th Infantry Division who were responsible for de defending most of Norfolk and parts of Suffolk further inland as well. But were one of the key units or key divisions of the um, home forces during the Second World War. Uh, so most of this talk is actually going to be looking at... Um, what I like to call the front line or the professional soldiers on the front line, uh, rather than, let's say, the amateurs in this case. Mm. So what's quite surprising as well today is that um, we still know very little about the defence of the uh, the UK during the Second World War, not just in 1940, throughout the first uh, Second World War period from 1939 up until essentially the, the end of the war. And when it comes to the primary fighting forces responsible for the country's defence, uh, the likes of the regular and territorial army, as well as the Commonwealth and the free forces, are relatively unforgotten. Let's say, you know, I know it's a key trope with wartime stuff, the forgotten story, but this story is <laughs> relatively forgotten. And their role within the home forces today, the story of that, um, that deployment is rarely told. Uh, so from here on, instead of saying regulars, territorials, Commonwealth and free forces, I'm just going to say regulars, but they were there were multiple, multiple um, military units involved in the home forces. Um, so we find or I find personally that um, the situation faced with today is that the period following the fall of France and the key invasion period, which lasted up until well, officially uh, December 1942, um, is one of the few deployments within the Allied forces of the British Army or and the Commonwealth Force and the regulars, um, where the role of the frontline fighting units is largely overlooked. And it has to be the only case of this um, taking place during the Second World War in terms of history. Um, I like to say it's the equivalent of trying to understand Operation Overlord by looking at the Royal Military Police or trying to understand the Battle of Britain by just looking at the RAF ground crews. These units mm. contributed a significant... Um, significant part of those operations, but were by no means on the front line and trying to understand an entire, not a battle that was never fought by looking at the second line units does not give you the whole picture. It's where a lot of research into the subject eventually, well, essentially falls down because people are looking at what well, was a second line fighting unit uh, that wasn't solely responsible for defense of the country. So, I'm going to cover two myths, and the first of these that is kind of often perpetuated inadvertently by Dad's army is that the Home Guard were the primary or only defence against an invasion or invasion during the Second World War. Um, so to cover this, I'm just going to first set the Home Guard in their context. Um, and I'm just going to quickly mention here that I hope I'm not treading on Andy Chatterton's feet here because he's got a book coming out next year, which will cover a lot of this subject. And it, it's going to be fantastic. So keep an eye out for that coming out later next year. Um, but yeah, let's put the Home Guard in context. So the defence of the UK... Uh, by the home forces wasn't just the responsibility of the infantry. The Royal Navy um, and the Air Forces were also involved in this as well. So this list here, I usually when I'm doing a PowerPoint, have this like go through sequentially with the points popping up, but it's, uh, it's just as fine this way. So I like to call this the order of battle. And at the uh, kind of the tip of the spear was the Royal Navy and Coastal Command. Their role, again, in terms of defence of the, um, the UK is relatively, relatively forgotten, let's say. So um before i go try and go off before i go off on a tangent a key part of the defense of the country uh during the second world war was knowing that the invading fleet was going to come and to counter this and to provide prior warning the royal navy um were active not only in the north sea but the channel um and they would have been out patrolling to give this prior warning of the invading fleet if it set sail without um without the military forces knowing so providing a key warning, tracking the invading fleet as it came in was vitally important because otherwise you're blind up until the point the invading fleet turns up. Um, and then second to this was obviously attacking the invading fleet at sea because if you can knock the troops out while they're in the boats in the ocean, they, you don't have to shoot them when they land on the beach. It makes things a bit easier. And this is something that comes out really nicely in the um, war diaries I'm reading through at the minute is that the key defence of East Yorkshire, for example, uh, focus a lot on attacking the invading fleet if it was to come while it was still at sea. 
Next, you have RAF Bomber Command and Fighter Command. So obviously, if Fighter Command hadn't been knocked out, they would have had a key role in defending um, the ground, so ground attack. But also another key thing coming from the War Diaries is um, almost weekly intelligence um, briefings uh, that were provided to the uh, battalions, brigades, and divisions. So the RAF was uh, clearly, and this was a new one, I just uh, decided to put this in just before I did the talk, was key to gathering intel and reconnaissance information on the forces as they built up on the continent, which is something I'm not not known about until starting to research this uh, within the couple of last couple of weeks and receiving a load of documents. When we come to the ground war, the um, tip of the spear in terms of the ground war was the Royal Artillery. And again, this role of them is almost completely forgotten today. So the coastal artillery batteries, which were numerous on all sections of the coast across the UK, would have been key to putting down counter battery fire on the on the supporting uh, German naval ships, but also intercepting landing craft as they came in. And you also had as well field batteries inland, which were sighted with putting down defensive fire tasks on vulnerable stretches of beaches and um, essentially supporting um, the infantry that were sighted to defend the coast and inland areas, in particular the coastal areas, because the enemy infantry are more vulnerable when they're on the beach. So if they're tied down on the beach, if you drop artillery on them, it's a lot easier to kill them that way. And this is where we come to the infantry. So the regular and territorial army, as well as the Commonwealth forces and the free forces, were the primary infantry force deployed for coastal and inland defence. There's no dispute in this. This image here on the right hand side is the Royal Scots Fusiliers at Walton on the Nays. Um, I forgot to put that in the thing, but yeah, so that's not Home Guard either. Um, and their key role was obviously static defence, but also a key thing that's under completely forgotten about is that or overlooked is the fact that the defences weren't primarily static. There was a local mobile reserve in most cases and uh, a mobile element to the defence. So when you see pictures of pillboxes and the like, soldiers in trenches, that gives the impression that the defences were completely static. The reality is there weren't. There was uh, a reserve in the vast majority of cases to undertake counterattack and overthrow positions that had been taken up by the enemy. Further inland, you have your GHQ reserve or General Headquarters reserve, who I'll be talking about more later. So behind your regular forces, this is where you come to the Home Guard or earlier on the local defence volunteers. And especially in 1940, 1941, they were an up-and-coming force. They didn't have the training or equipment necessarily to undertake a primary role, which is why they were specifically given tasks of defending their immediate area. So local towns, villages, associated defences, usually in the form of roadblocks. They weren't a, I can't think of the word, they weren't responsible for active counterattack in this period of 1949-41. In Northern Command in Yorkshire, it's not until the end of 41 that they start to be incorporated into some of the reserve forces to provide a counterattack element if needs be. But that's a story for another day. Then, as I've already mentioned, inland you have the GHQ reserves. These were um, essentially uh, the better equipped units following the fall of France um, that had been deployed in the UK within the home forces uh, without being deployed to France. And these were some of the better equipped units that were located in land. And the role of these was to provide a counter-attack on a national scale, essentially, um, and essentially provide the knockout blow to the invading force. So if I'll go into this more uh, later, I'll cover this in more detail. And worth mentioning as well, the auxiliary units and special duties, which get a lot of attention, but often out of context. When you put them in context, they would have had a pre key role in providing not only um, destruction of enemy resources and uh, infrastructure that had been landed and would be hard to replace, such as fuel and uh, aircraft and things like that, but also providing intelligence on the invading force moving inland. So when you put the Home Guard in, in context, if you're just looking at the Home Guard themselves, you're just getting this small, minute part of the picture. When you put them in context, their role makes a lot more sense. And uh, I'm going to provide you, because you You've all been very nice to me. I'm going to give you a case study from my research. So I'm doing a lot of, uh, so I've spent nearly 20 years recording um, Second World War anti-invasion defence in Yorkshire and elsewhere. And I've only just started to start to look at the documentary side of things. So this is a, literally within the past month, I've started to compile the information. This is going to give you an idea of what was going on with the 8th, 8th Battalion of the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry, which were a unit that were formed in between June and 
let's say September 1940. So these were a relatively fresh unit and they were deployed almost immediately to defend um, the East Yorkshire coast around Sperm Point. So if anyone if anyone knows where this is, this is East, East Yorkshire coast around the River Humber. Essentially in Sperm Point, if you ever go, it's a fantastic place. So the 8th Battalion were responsible for, I've calculated an area of about 52 square miles of Yorkshire. Um, and this red area indicates from the War Diary the area they were responsible for defending. So usually today, when you see the coastal defences, you just think they were responsible for defending the coastline. Their area of responsibility for a battalion of 800 to 900 men was much wider, you know, 52 square miles. Let's take a quick look at some of their defensive tasks. So within the War Diaries, um, you get a shed load of information. And I like to plot this on a map um, and make it massively complicated so you can't really see what's going on. But this demonstrates just a percentage of some of their defensive tasks that were going on. So these kind of um, red and white uh, hexagons on the beach, these are their forward line of defense located on the on the coast. This is their, essentially, yeah, the front line defense is sighted to defend the vulnerable stretch coastline. But then when you come inland, you've got these blue lines here, which indicate the areas that the reserve company from the battalion were to take up to counter enemy troops landing, um, either by a parachute or by powered aircraft. Gliders were not a primary responsibility of defence. But that's a story again for another time. So this role of anti-airborne defence um, is something that's often attributed to the Home Guard. But in this case, the Home Guard were not responsible for it. The 8th Battalion were, along with, interestingly enough, um, units from searchlight um, batteries located in land as well, which is complete news to me. I wasn't aware of this role of the searchlight batteries. Um, also inland, you've got a single company, so 150 soldiers located slightly inland to provide this counterattack element. And they themselves were supported by um, one mobile troop of six pounder guns at Burstwick. Um, so that's about six six pounder guns, which would have been key to knocking out heavier tanks. Um, the infantry themselves were issued with anti-tank rifles, as you'd expect, and also Molotov cocktails so, or self-igniting phosphorus grenades, which are often attributed to the Home Guard. The 8th Battalion had over 600 of these within the battalion. So the, this is a weapon system, although often attributed to the Home Guard, was key to the regular and territorial units as well. So a lot of information going on there, but this gives you an idea of how extensive the defence was and some of the responsibilities of the 8th Battalion in their short uh, period. Well, they were in, uh, in East Yorkshire for about three or four months with this specific role of defending this area. This war diary also gives an insight into the role of the Home Guard, which is really, really cool. So you're able to see the role of the Home Guard in contrast with the role of a battalion of the regular or territorial army. So here I've um, overlaid these green green polygons onto the, um, the red polygon of the uh, 8th Battalion, and these show the areas that, of responsibility for, of the Home Guard. So these are the villages that were defended solely by the Home Guard. So you can see there's a massive disparity there. If you look just at the Home Guard, you're missing out this wider picture in terms of defence. So each of these green polygons, yeah, essentially reflects the village generally defended by anything between a couple of platoons or a company of Home Guard. Key point here is the Home Guard were under direct command of the commander of the 8th Battalion King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry. So they, they weren't an autonomous entity within this defence. They were under direct command of the local TA unit essentially, and it was the decision of the commander of the 8th Battalion who would make this decision whether the Home Guard would even deploy. So only out of all these villages, only three of them, uh, upon receiving the orders of action stations and stand two, only three of these villages would be guaranteed if the invading force was uh, on its way to actually stand to and occupy defences. The rest were completely at the discretion of the commander of the Home Forces. But a key point here is these three villages, so I, I can't really, I should have labeled these, but three of these villages, the, the re, one of the reasons I think they were key to, they would have been stood to in the event of, uh, or threat of invasion, was that the Home Guard here were key to keeping this road network in East Yorkshire free to allow the territorial army units to essentially counterattack and move freely through the landscape. So although the Home Guard you know, we're essentially sitting still occupying roadblocks and a secondary force. Their role was still key to the operation of the TA units and would have been vital to the defence of this part of East Yorkshire had the German Germans invaded. And again, this role would have been vitally important. It's something, you know, that wouldn't have been given to bumbling idiots, um, you know, if they <laughs> weren't seen fit, you know. And uh, again, hopefully that gives you an insight into kind of like an actual deployment of the Home Guard in relation to 
a regular or territorial army battalion. So hopefully that gives some insight. Right, myth number two. I'm going to cover this really quickly because I've got a minute and a half. Uh, another key myth that comes about is that the home guard are the last line of defense. We'll give you it's another three. Another three. Okay, uh, it shouldn't take us that long, but yeah, we'll, uh, okay. Um, so or four. You, or four, okay. I'll try, I'll, I'll get it wrapped up in that. Um, so a key myth here is that the home guard, you know, and I like to say this is, as a result of Dad's army just focusing on the home guard, is that they were the last line of defense. They weren't, and I've kind of hinted at this already. So I already mentioned the general headquarters reserve. These were essentially two cores of um, mobile infantry and armored units located quite cleverly in the UK. Um, I've got a set of resources if you want to investigate the home force in more detail, which looks at the wider picture of this, but you can Google those. Um, but we're just going to look at four core and seven core. So four core um, were one of the two... Um, two corps responsible as part of the GHQ reserves. You also had other infantry divisions located um, or under the direct command of the home force as well for additional counterattack needs, but we're just gonna focus on the, these two corps. So four corps located, so let me just skip back, located to the north of London um, in this prime, primary strategic location, really, really clever stuff. They comprised of the 2nd Armoured Division, the 43rd Wessex Infantry Division, a TA unit, and the 1st Armoured Reconnaissance Brigade. These were some of the better equipped units that had been left over or had never been seen, had never seen fighting in France. And as a result, they were relatively well equipped in comparison to the units that were pulled out of, um, out of the fight in France. And with them being deployed to the north of London, they could easily deploy a counter-attacking stroke into East Anglia, so Norfolk, Suffolk, uh, and Essex, if they really wanted to do that. Um, as well as north into Lincolnshire and potentially to the west towards Wales if the invading force came from the west. Also, they could push south to reinforce London and counterattack. As we know, in hindsight, that the invading force would have landed on the south coast. They could have been deployed further south. So coming on to Seven Corps, this is where the key thing of the Commonwealth forces and the free forces comes in. A key aspect of Seven Corps was the 1st Canadian Division, 2nd New Zealand Division. In fact, there were even Maoris within uh, the New Zealand Division, which is something that goes overlooked. The 1st Canadian Division were apparently the only fully equipped division in the UK following the fall of France, so I've been told. Seven Corps, um, located just behind the South Coast, again, would have been at the essentially one of the earliest forms of GHQ reserve to be deployed and off this counterattack. But the key thing here is, had these reserves been deployed too early or too late or failed in any form, in any way to stop or halt the invading force, the defence of the country would have been over. And as such, the, uh, the GHQ reserves are the final line of defence. It's not the Home Guard. But hopefully the next time you watch Dad's Army or um, see someone saying they don't like it up on Facebook in response to a pillbox, you remember that it wasn't just the... Uh, the reg it wasn't just the Home Guard um, that were responsible for de defending the UK. There were over somewhere between 300,000, 500,000 troops in 10, 29 divisions of the Home Forces deployed to defend the UK, of which the Home Guard were a key aspect and an integral element to the defence of the UK, but they were by no means the final line of defence or the, um, the sole units responsible for defence, They were, but they were a key part of this Home Force network. And... Um, alongside, obviously, the regular and territorial army units, they deserve to be remembered today. Oh, that was well, all right. What a blinder! Um, uh, there was me putting pressure on, saying how Phil Blood knocked it out of the park. You've just, you've just won the follow-up game. That's it. We've done the FA That's good to know. Champions League. Um, <laughs> and I don't know whether to, to, to hug you or or or, or, or be angry with you because I don't think I can now watch an episode of Dad's Army now without thinking of <laughs> what the regular army guys all going to the same pubs and stuff but that's yeah the point. I, I, mean, I i've ruined it for myself as well that's the annoying thing because i love that army. <laughs> i mean it's it, it i think that you, you you hit the 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 serious study was fantastic by the way but i think that the thing at the beginning that i think you really hit something with me is because dad's army ran for whatever it was a, a decade or something yeah there's 20 no years, 20 years. Line, so you kind of think it's you, you you don't see the evolution and i and, and, and neither did Alo Alo, and neither did you know you know any of these other shows there but i think that's probably what's done the particular damage is this oh yeah this sense that it stayed like that the whole war and there are still little old men with pitchforks on the bloody brighton on sea pier in 1944 yeah. when v1s are flying over yeah exactly that yeah so what i like about dad's army is the first you know i'm a massive dad's army fan i live just down the road from thetford these days and i like to go to the museum uh, um, yeah, yeah. um but the key thing with dad's army is 
the first series and second series do show this initial the initial days very well, and then after that it yeah. kind of goes off on a tangent and just becomes like about bumbling idiots and getting. Into they have funny to go around. They, they've run out of. Yeah, they can't. They can't keep the history going because they they've done that. So yeah, they can't. Yeah, I see that. But exactly, we yeah. will bring things to an except. I think I've already had loads of requests in the sidebar to bring him back. This deserves a long format show. How the Home Guard trainer? I remember having a few Home Guard training manuals in my collection. Oh, I was I've really got a... surprised how detailed they were. And in fact, yeah. you could say more advanced. It's like they had more time to think. I remember the camouflage for like urban warfare. There was like, yeah. you, can, you know, you can blue cigarette packets, your helmet netting and stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, it sounds yeah. a bit idiotic, but really advanced. Oh, yeah. When you look at the those manuals, which were published in, I think, about 40, late 42, 43, yeah. they're really down on, what's it called, Fibua now, fighting in built-up yeah, areas. Exactly. Yeah, That's Really on top of that. And you can see, you know, if you look into the modern modern um, urban warfare, you can see how those lessons have been learned in the Second World War and still apply today. And it's really interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just you've left us wanting more, which is always the best way to go. But we've got to end things now because we've got an important discussion with Dr. Kate Vigers in cool, nice. well, five minutes time now. So, Chris, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, absolute storming show. We've all learned a lot. And I think the, 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 the sidebar discussion, some people are saying they knew a lot about some of the myths we've uh, we covered. Some of them, this is all completely new. There's Americans Excellent. watching this who don't, didn't even know what Dad's Army was. Right. We've learned a whole lot about it. So it's it's worked on two levels. So there we are. Excellent. Fantastic. Folks, I will see you in four minutes' time. This meanwhile, just go and have a cup cup of tea if you if you want to, but I'll see you in five minutes uh for the women in history. See you in a minute. Bye.